Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Master Series, your guide to intelligent production, brought to you by Entertainment Partners. In the Master Series, we focus on important issues impacting the entertainment industry and its workers through in-depth discussions with legal, tax, payroll, technology, and production experts. And today's topic is Film Financing Explained, World Revenues, Foreign Sales, and Senior Debt. And our expert panel will be discussing how shopping your project around the world can be a substantial part of your production's financing plan. Two quick housekeeping items as we get started today. First is that we encourage you to post questions for our panel in the Q&A section of the Zoom call. You can do so by clicking the Q&A in the Zoom navigation menu, and we'll do our best to save time after the discussion to answer questions. Also, please take 30 seconds to answer a short feedback survey following today's webinar. This is an opportunity for you to give us feedback about today's discussion, as well as to suggest topics for future webinars. And your feedback is very important to us, so 30 seconds is all that we ask. Now let's meet today's guest panelists. Today we are joined by Daisy Stahl, Executive Vice President and Head of Entertainment Finance at California Bank and Trust. Daisy's career spans over 25 years in banking and finance within the entertainment industry, financing transactions in film, television, music, catalog acquisitions, and M&A deals. During her career, Daisy spent a decade in finance at Sony Pictures, serving as the studio's assistant treasurer. While at Sony, she was responsible for managing $1 billion and global liquidity, all foreign exchange and capital funding for the studio's film and television productions, as well as operating subsidiaries in over 33 countries around the world. Daisy serves as board member and treasurer for the nonprofit group Female Executives in Media and Entertainment, and she also serves on the DEI subcommittee to mentor and build the next generation of female executives. Also with us is David Oliver, director of the entertainment group at CIT Bank. Throughout his career, David has sourced, structured, and closed more than $2 billion in transactions, serving as underwriter and administrative agent on a wide variety of senior debt transactions in film, television, music, and sports, including the 2021 relaunch of Castle Rock Entertainment as an independent studio. Prior to CIT, he held positions at Comerica Bank, City National Bank, and the Tribeca Film Festival, and he began his career as a recording producer at PGM Recordings, a company which he later ran. Also with us today is Tom Era, partner and co-lead of Sports Media and Entertainment Finance and Transactions Group at DLA Piper. Tom focuses his practice on entertainment and media industry transactions, both domestic and international, for more than two decades. He advises feature film studios, television networks, production companies, internet and mobile-based content producers and distributors in corporate transactions, as well as in the development, production, and distribution of feature films, television programs, and digital content. He also advises borrowers and commercial banks, hedge funds, private equity funds, and high net worth individuals and family offices as senior lenders, mezzanine lenders, and equity investors in numerous film and television financings, and has led multi-picture financing transactions, including revolving and long-term facilities for standalone film and television funds and mini studios, as well as co-financing arrangements with major studios. And finally, today's guest moderator is our resident financing expert, John Hattity, Executive Vice President of the Incentives Group here at Entertainment Partners, where he specializes in the monetization of tax credits and minimum guarantees. John began his career at Orion Classics, a division of Orion Pictures, where he served as technical and administrative director. He is former president and CEO of Hattity & Associates, a consultancy firm that specializes in risk management and production finance. He is also former Executive Vice President President of Motion Picture Television Production Finance for Miramax Films, and projects recently financed include Snowden, American Made, and The Assistant. Good morning and good afternoon, John and panelists. It is so lovely to see all of you today. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion. Thanks, Natalie. And hello, everybody, and welcome, friends. Um, I have had the distinct pleasure of working with everyone on this panel um, for a long time, so I'm thrilled that you guys could join me, and um, I'm excited to have this conversation. So today we're going to talk about world revenue, right, and how to leverage the value of your project on a worldwide basis and, and how you can actually borrow money against the, the estimated value of your project. So, so I, let's, well, let's first define minimum guarantee because that's what we're really focused on today. So, so when, you, when you sell your movie, so Daisy, I'll throw this out at you. When you sell your movie, 
right? Pre-sale, maybe you pre do a pre-sale in, in one, two, several territories. Um, do you get the money right away when you close the deal? No, you do not get the money right away. In fact, in most instances, when a distribution agreement is structured as a minimum guarantee, the distributor has agreed per the contract to pay the producer a fixed amount upon completion and delivery of the film. So what that places on the producer is they have to find a way to uh, cash flow their production. And then when the film is completed and delivered, that triggers the payment obligations uh, by the distributors. So if, so if you don't deliver the film, then the deal's not even worth the paper it's written on, right? That's correct. So if you're halfway through production, you run out of money and you can't complete the film, there's no value to the distributor and it doesn't trigger their payment obligation. So, so Tom, let me ask you, so how you, because you, you've both represented producers in transactions like this, but you've also represented the banks and the lenders um, that may be lending against that paper. Um, what can a producer do to ensure that the movie does get delivered, that it does get finished, that it won't run out of money? Uh, well, you, you used uh, uh, a, a word that uh, is oftentimes uh, uh, mislabeled when it comes to um, ensuring delivery or completion of the film, which is insured, right? So a lot of our audience, I'm sure, have heard of the concept of a completion bond, uh, completion guarantee, and uh, oftentimes it's confused with insurance which is a separate component of uh, a production, ensuring the production crew, uh, ensuring um, the production related matters, the film negative, et cetera. But uh, to your question about how do you ensure that the film gets delivered, it's actually a, an aligned interest between the producer and the bank to ensure uh, that that film gets delivered because the bank would like to collect on those uh, distribution MGs or minimum guarantees you noted, and that's done by way of a completion bond. And um, unlike insurance, even though some completion guarantors are backed by insurance companies or insurers, uh, unlike insurance, the completion bond's role is to ensure completion and delivery of the picture. And if it cannot accomplish that, it is to pay back the financiers. Uh, the sums that they've put at risk in the picture. And so uh, obviously one way to do what you, what you asked, which is to ensure delivery or, or completion of the film is to have a completion guarantor on board. Now they only get involved if things go sideways. Uh, they're, they're not really in they're, They don't like to produce movies. Uh, they want to be in the background, making sure things stay on track kind of as a checks and balances and overseeing things, but uh, the last thing they want to do and the last thing a producer or a bank wants them to do is produce the movie because that's not really the creative role that they want to be in. Right. And I, I, I actually have heard producers talk about completion guarantors in, in a way that makes them sound like the police, right? When in fact, they can actually be extremely helpful right you're talking about a very few companies right three or four maybe five that have been in this business for a long time and consistently have dealt with production exigencies right it, it's it, it they've seen it before right they've done thousands of films they've come across whatever problem you're having they've come across that before and they probably know how to fix it right and so I think there's a real advantage. I think some people are a little afraid. They get they get a little scared thinking that there's going to be like this money police looking over your shoulder. Um, but in fact, they can be a wonderful resource, right? And a, and a sense of real right. support when you're making a project. So, okay, so we, we know that you've got You've got help. You've got someone that's that's standing by that's going to ensure that you do complete and deliver the film, hopefully on time and on budget. You're not going to run out of out of money. Um, 
when you walk, David, when somebody walks into your office um, and they've got uh, estimates of what they think the, the value of their movie is around the world, right? When they may have estimates of what they think they can sell the movie for if they get into Sundance or they get into the Toronto Film Festival. What would a North American distributor be willing to pay for it? What would a distributor in France want to pay for the film? You know, wh where do the numbers come from? So uh, when we're presented with those kinds of estimates, uh, they will come from a sales agent that the production company has engaged to do the international pre-sales and sales of, of that film. So typically when uh, a bank gets involved, at least in my experience with a producer who comes to us with a film that is going to go into production, they've already engaged a, a sales agent. Uh, often some pre-sales have already been made. So the process has already started. So we will take a look at the estimates of, uh, of the sales agent. If some sales have already been made, we'll see if the sales agent met the estimates that they originally gave and, and we'll assess what's there. And, and typically what we'll see if it is what's called a split rights deal, which means that the producer is selling the distribution rights to that film uh, to different territories around the world. So one for the UK, one for France, and, and so on ar around the world. Uh, and, and we'll take a look at them and, and we'll assess them. Um, sometimes we'll have conversations with, with third parties, people we know well, just to understand where the numbers came from uh, and, and, and we'll take it from there. But just to, to, just to be clear, the, the bank is going to be lending on actual pre-sales. So sales that have been made before the production actually starts. But the estimates that are put together in advance are, are an important uh, earlier step. And, and you can lend against both, right? You can lend against pre-sales and you, you also have the opportunity, or pro, a producer has the opportunity to take out a loan, not only against deals that have been concluded, but based on the unsold territories too, right? That, that's right. So, so lending against the, the estimates, which are the unsold territories at the point in time you're talking about, that we, the term we use for that is gap. So uh, one way that a loan can look is that we'll lend against pre-sales, sales that have actually been made, and then some portion of the value of the estimates of what hasn't yet been sold at the time that the film starts production, which is when typically the producer needs the loan to close and they need the funds so they can produce the film. Right. So when I've gone to film festivals, I always get the, the book right? That lists all the sales agents that are there and all the projects that they're representing and all the people that will be representing that company at the market. How on earth do you choose? And Daisy, I'll throw this out at you. How on earth, when you look at hundreds, there are hundreds of sales agents, right? In this book, you know, if somebody walks into your office and, and it says Dave's sales estimates, Right. Uh, you know, uh, how do you choose? How do you choose this, the sales agents that you um, have confidence in, um, whose work your whose work product you have confidence in? And, and look, from a from a lender's perspective, you want to mitigate as much risk, risk as possible. Right. So how, how do you begin the process of selecting, you know, the estimates or the person who's actually creating those estimates for you to work with? Well, I think the first starting point is you have to look at your own project. You know, what is your project in terms of budget size, in terms of genre, and in terms of audience, your target audience? And the reason why you need to be very clear about what your target audience is in your genre is because you want to look for a sales agent that has experience selling similar kinds of projects, right? So if you have, you know, um, an artistic drama, it's not necessarily the wisest choice to select a sales agent who is really huge and prominent, but they've 
they really focus on sci-fi or action films, right? So that may not be their their strong point or their strength is selling your kind of project. Um, so that's that's the starting point is, you know, what is the history of that particular distributor in selling similar kinds of projects to yours? The second is to really perform your diligence. Um, you know, we all operate in a market that is so heavily based on reputation, right? right. So we all know and have gotten to know over many years, you know, individuals, their reputation for delivering on what they promised, some, you know, over promise and under deliver. And a lot of it is, you know, um, word of mouth and talking to individuals that you may know or that you're connected with in terms of how did they work with you? You're asking somebody else, how did they work with you when they were selling your project? Right. And asking those kinds of questions, you don't have to dig deep into the details. But, you know, with your project, did they hit their estimates? You know, what was their ask and their take and where did they really land? Um, And also to look at if those uh, sales agents have strong relationships with the distributors that they sell to, because that's also a very positive thing. You know, if they have a strong relationship with, you know, a certain distributor in certain territories, then that's a pipeline that they're, they're providing to that distributor that if they take your project on, it's something that will be shopped to a consistent um, relationship that that sales agent has. So let's, you used, you use uh, the terms ask and take, and let's talk about that for a second, because that that that's a, an important component of this. So I'll I'll throw it out there to to all three of you, um, anybody who wants to jump in. But let's let's talk about ask and take. What what are we really talking about here? Well, I can start, and and gentlemen, feel free to chime in. But so the ask and take is basically uh, the high and the low. And so we as lenders, I will usually ask if somebody has sales estimates, I need to see the ask and the take. And then that gives me a range. And then I make an assessment if the ask and take is reasonable. And and David had alluded to this earlier that um, even with um, sales that have been executed, you know, we want to know what was their original ask or their high point. And when they sold that contract, where did they land? Was it closer to the ask or was it on the take? Um, Because we as lenders, eventually, if we're open to lending against the value of those unsold territories, we need to understand how that sales agent and their capability and how reasonable those numbers really are before we um, lend against them. So, Tom, let me me throw this to you. Um, with respect to the take, um, <clears throat> you know, you've represented producers that are have gone to banks and and wanted to borrow against these foreign sales estimates. Um, I, I'm I'm guessing that the producer is not participating in every single discussion with every single distributor, right? That's the sales agent's job, right? So, is it safe to say that the take is kind of the minimum threshold that a sales agent would have to meet if they're going to conclude a sale? Well, uh, let's keep in mind, these are estimates. (laughs) So um, they are, uh, and sales agency agreements will make clear that the estimates are not guaranteed amounts or sums that, that the sales agent will deliver on. Um, Look, I, I think, um, and Daisy really did a great job of kind of walking through the, the 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 difference between the two. And I think more importantly for your audience, what goes on in the mind of a banker, because that that, that is probably more important than anything. And a question that we as lawyers get asked, and and I always tell the producers, talk with your banker because they will oftentimes, like Daisy just did, walk you through their thought process of how they determine whether estimates make sense to lend against, whether it's Gap or even the MGs themselves, because the prospects of the film's success depend heavily on what Daisy pointed out, which is, are they they hitting at the take or above the take on sales they've made 
or below the take. Um, and that's an indication, you know, what, what's the saying in, in an investment market past performance is, is, is not an indication of future, but well, it is in this case, you know? Um, so I think in, in a lot of ways, um, you know, when we're talking about the take as an, as a threshold number, we've seen sales agents perform well below the takes, particularly in uncertain markets. Um, I think what we look for if we're on the lender side and as a producer, what we talk to our producers about is work with a sales agent that has a reputation for being not super conservative, but generally um, delivering on their, their, their promises. Of course, banks and everyone else understands there are extenuating circumstances that get in the way. We've seen them happen, whether it's you know, world events or, or pandemics. With all that said, outside of that, I think what you look for is a take number that makes sense. Sometimes what happens is producers will lean on the sales agent to back out of the budget. And that's where it gets a little bit dangerous because then you kind of have manufactured numbers, right? The budget can't dictate the take numbers. The market has to dictate the take numbers. And that's probably the most important takeaway from this point. It, would you would you say, and I guess my, I'll ask David and Daisy this, uh, would, would you do you ever act as a resource for a produ- if a producer wants to find a sales agent, right? And as I said, there are hundreds and hundreds out there, right? <clears throat> do you ever act as a resource for producers to help identify sales agents that, that, that perhaps you might be comfortable working with or you have a track record of working well with and whose, whose um, opinions you respect more than others? Or is that, or, or are you conflicted if somebody were to call you and say, hey, can you recommend a sales agent? I mean, if, if I got a call and it was, you know, general like that, um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to, to give an answer without having some more information. Each film is distinct. And each film, as a producer who's worked with sales agents before knows, there is a, a right sales agent for, for that film who's going to serve it the, the, the best way and devise the best d- distribution strategy for it. So well, let's talk a little bit about cash. Um, well, let's say that, that someone ha- ha- has a sales agent and they, that sales agent has concluded some sales. Uh, so let's, let's take pre-sales first. Um, they've concluded those sales and you see that the distribution agreement that the, that the sales agent has entered into on behalf of the producer is for let's I'll make it up a hundred thousand dollars. So they they've sold the distribution rights in the UK for a hundred thousand um, dollars. The the deal is signed by the producer and signed by the distributor in the UK, and they walk into your office um, with that document. Do you lend them? Is the loan a hundred thousand dollars generally, or is it discounted in any way, or does it depend? It, it depends. So we will also look at the underlying distributor. We'll look at that distributor and A, do I know them? B, if I don't know them, I will perform diligence on what they've released in the past and try and find out information that's available in the market. Usually we'll do a fair amount of diligence if it's a private distributor to do trade checks. You know, We call around town, have these folks paid as agreed, what kind of minimum guarantees are customary for them? So let's say, you know, this distributor, it's a hundred thousand, um, but somebody else says, and commonly they, they pay MGs around the hundred thousand. Um, but somebody else comes to me, same distributor, and they want to give an MG that was 1.5 million. So that's an outlier for that kind of distributor. So those are the kinds of things that we um, will perform in terms of research and due diligence. And after we do that uh, research and due diligence, that's where we will apply what we refer to as an advance rate. So if, if it's a reasonable you know, um, company that we've found 
strong historical performance, we might lend um, a percentage of that 100,000. It might be 80,000 against that 100,000. If they're really strong and well-known, it might be we'll advance 100,000, like full advance against that. But generally, the methodology is any kind of distribution agreement will look at each individual distributor and we will apply that advance rate based on their underlying strength and reputation. John, if I if I can jump in on this too, yeah. um, but you know, yeah. the one kind of uh, clear statement I want to make is banks are in the business of taking credit risk. That is what their business is based on. They can do diligence on the the obligors to determine credit worthiness, and but but what they're not in the business of is taking performance risk. Right? They don't want to take the risk that a producer is a good producer or a bad producer. Of course, they take that into account whether they're going to lend to a particular producer. Uh, they don't want to take the risk of unknown or extenuating circumstances preventing a film from being completed and made. That's why we have completion bonds and insurances, right? But, but I think the credit risk part of it is something that that's what banks are very good at. They understand credit. They understand the market and and who is credit worthy and who is not. And I think that's an area where there's a lot of confusion. In fact, I don't want to jump ahead on your Q&A, but I saw some statements about banks investing. Banks are not investors, right? And filmed. They're lenders. Um, and that's that's good in a lot of ways because they don't take a piece of the profits. They don't, you know, they're in it for their principal and their interest. That's their compensation. And oftentimes they're very competitive in that regard as opposed to equity or investors. So it's a very important distinction that a lot of new producers don't understand when they're trying to get their first film financed by a bank. In fact, I'm sure Daisy and David will tell you as other bankers will, how many calls they have to field by people who say, Hey, will you invest in my movie? <laughs> and then the answer is we don't invest in movies. We we're a bank. We finance movies. Yes. Thank you well, for safe. clarifying yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say maybe, Go ahead, Daisy. John, if you could let me clarify. So when you pose the question of this $100,000 minimum guarantee and what we can lend against it, really what we do, as Tom had pointed out, is that we will look at a pool of distribution agreements. If a producer sells their content territory by territory, and let's say they are successful, the, the, the sales agent sells to 20 territories. So you have 20 different distributors. So we will look at each of those distribution agreements. We will apply an advance rate based on the credit worthiness of that individual distributor. And we will lend against that pool of distribution agreements. And that, that lending is what we fund, we can, we can fund the production of the content. So, so let's address the credit worthiness aspect. So, you know, you're talking like in, in the scenario where you're talking about maybe 20 deals have been concluded. Um, that means that eventually if the film is completed and delivered, to all of those distributors, then the checks should come, right? But the producer doesn't have the wherewithal or the relationships to go and hop on a plane and go collect those checks, right? So how the bank needs absolute certainty that that money will be collectible, right? So even if you've gotten past the credit worthiness aspect of your due diligence, the check still has to come, right? And a lot of stuff can happen between the day a deal is done and when the check is actually supposed to be sent. So what, what does the bank do to ensure that collectability? David, sure, I'll throw well, it over to you. Sure. I mean, th this really uh, is something that, that Tom can talk about, but the lawyers who the banks work with in documenting one of these loans are a critical piece uh, of, the, of, the, of the financing. So there will be an actual contract uh, between the producer, the sales agent, the bank, and this distributor. And in the case of where you're splitting the rights and there are many distributors for one film, there'll be many contracts. So the contract is what we rely on uh, from a legal point of view. Uh, and Tom can 
speak to, to some of the details there, but the, but the other aspect of it, um, which Daisy touched on, uh, is something that we call trade checks. So even with distributors, we have a lot of experience with, a lot of track record of receiving their MG minimum guarantee payments uh, in the amount and, and when they're due, we'll still be checking in to make sure that their operation in their local country is still going well, that the, the company is still uh, functioning as it should be, um, and that there haven't been any events that have happened where either they haven't paid for something or they've argued about having to pay for something when, when, when it was due. From the bank's point of view, um, you know, there is this sort of reputational aspect also, which deters a lot of foreign distributors from not fulfilling their obligations on, on the contract. If one distributor just chooses not to pay what's due when they receive the delivered film, that news will go out through the industry very, very quickly. That, that is a reason uh, that sort of that doesn't really have to do with, with the contract specifically uh, of the why, why these people pay when they have to. Yeah, John, just to so to add to that, as David mentioned, um, one of the biggest shocks that comes to producers when they're doing a, a bank financing is when they get the legal document checklist and it's 15 pages, they, they fall on the floor and didn't realize they, there was that much paper that goes into uh, getting um, one one financing done. But but as David mentioned, every single one of these distributors must enter into uh, an, an agreement effectively with the bank and various other parties. Uh, we refer to it as an NOA or notice of assignment. There are different forms of it. There are directions to pay and other forms, depending on the distributor, um, that gives legal protection to the bank and direct privity between the bank and that distributor. From a practical perspective, the collection duty falls heavily on the sales agent. That is really the sales agent's job because those relationships over many, many years are relationships these sales agents have made with the distributors. They've probably, at the time they sold your film, they probably sold three other films to that same distributor. And so there's a lot going on relationship-wise between those parties. And so they can they're in the best position to lean on that distributor to pay because the distributor wants the sales agent's films and the sales agent wants the distributor to keep buying. So there's, it's a symbiotic kind of relationship that makes the most sense. The bank's not the party that really should be on the front lines asking for a payment. That only happens if things go really wrong, um, which we don't, we don't hope happens. <laughs> right. All right. So, and let's, and let's, I mean, the, you know, the senior debt is actually in the title of this, of this sem this webinar, um, and and so let's be clear: the the bank financing in any shape or form is first position senior debt, right? It gets that gets paid back before anything else. That gets paid back before investors start to see money, before the producer starts to see money. That that is always the first thing that gets addressed, right? And I. I don't know. There, there is an asterisk on that, though, John, because okay. there are some fees that may come out uh, ahead of the bank's repayment. And, and one, for example, if you use a collection account in some cases where a bank might be in the waterfall, that might be a component. But banks usually receive funds directly and not through a collection agent. So that doesn't become a factor. But the sales agent may negotiate a corridor to receive some portion of either their expenses and or their commission uh, ahead of the bank because they are doing that work uh, and they need to be compensated. And sometimes it's like a reduced percentage uh, or deferred or non-deferred, but that really is without, uh, and maybe there might be some other kind of expenses that are very kind of limited and finite, uh, but uh, you're right. I mean, generally, I think the assumption is senior lender bank comes out first. And, well, and you know, I'm sorry, David, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I was just going to add, there was something sort of fundamental that, that may be obvious to, to many people on the call, but just in case not, 
Uh, so it's not just that the bank is, is repaid first, but because it is a loan, once the bank is repaid, the bank goes away. So whatever backend arrangements that you that the producer has created with equity investors or, or anyone else and, and distributors, uh, the bank does not take part in those after the bank has been repaid on, on its loan. Right. Which is one, one of the advantages to the, to the producer of engaging with a bank to get production financing. Right. And and let's I want to I want to shift gears a little bit, but let's let's first address the words minimum guarantee. What what we're talking about is when a distribution deal is entered into the minimum guarantee is the minimum amount of money you can expect to receive from that distributor. But it doesn't necessarily mean there won't be any more. Right. So a, a film could be wildly successful in a particular territory, and you've already received the minimum guarantee, but it's quite possible that once the distributor recoups their expenses, right, and the minimum guarantee that they've paid the producer or the bank, there could be more money, right, at which could filter through. Now, it, it wouldn't filter through to the bank, though, right? It would filter through to the producer unless there was some shortfall in the overall loan facility, right? That's right. Yes, that's right. right. So, so I, I, again, I want, I want to shift gears a little bit. I'll tell you that a couple of years ago, I had two executives from two rather large streaming platforms address my students at Columbia. And I asked them as, as stream, I mean, certainly now the streaming platforms are, you know, having, they have world dominance in a lot of places, but, you know, I started to get worried when I asked them, when you pick up a project, what is it exactly that you're acquiring and how do you determine what you pay for that? And they both without hesitation, they both said, our goal is always to pick up worldwide rights in perpetuity and we'll pay what we want to pay, right? Which caused me great concern because I thought if you're an independent producer and let's say you cobble together enough money to make your $10 million film and you showed it to a streaming platform who decided they wanted to pick it up for the world, but they only wanted to pay $5 million, right? That's, that's problematic, right? So you, you may or may not have gotten foreign sales estimates done on your project, but they kind of go out the window if you conclude a sale like I just talked about, right? And where does that leave the bank? So, so I guess my first question is, um, what does, how does the bank protect itself so that a situation like that doesn't interfere in any way with the paying back of the loan? Well, I think we would need to know in the out, at the outset while we're looking at the sales strategy, you know, is the strategy to continue to sell um, distributor by distributor around the world or is the strategy to sell to a streamer, right? One could argue that it may be easier for me as a lender to finance one streamer contract, let's say Amazon or Apple. It's easy to finance that paper, um, but the producer often will have given up worldwide rights in perpetuity. And that streaming, that streamer and whatever their, their purchase price is, has to be enough to cover the budget. Plus, some kind of profit on top of it. So in your example, if the production budget is 10 million, let's say Apple knocks on your door and says, I saw your, your uh, project at Cannes. I want to buy your $10 million budget project for 12 million, but I want it in perpetuity worldwide. So the producer will have 2 million in locked in profit. You call it a day, right? You go home. But there's, you've got certainty in that. 
but then you don't own and you don't have the ability to continue to monetize that content worldwide and receive additional revenues from that content. So I guess that's a very long answer to your question that we would need to know up front before we enter into a financing, what the strategy is. If a producer, and I've heard of this instance, um, if a producer engages a sales agent and they've started to sell certain territories, let's say they've sold five territories, but then a streamer comes along and says, I want to pay X for worldwide rights. Well, then you have to undo all of those other distribution agreements that you just entered into. And there's a cost to do that. And Tom, maybe you could better explain, I mean, unwinding contracts might be painful, um, but if the streamer is going to pay you an additional $5 million in profit and you want to take that $5 million in profit and run and call it a day, then you'll have to do the work to not damage the relationships with, those, with the sales agent and the distributors that you already sold to. Yeah, that, that's that's right. I mean, I, and and a number of the distributors, both domestic and foreign, have gotten wise to that in the past decade and have built in, you know, pretty severe penalties if you did that. Um, of course, you know, there's always a relationship. Again, going back to the sales agent, going to the distributor and saying, "Look, we need your your help on this one. Uh, we'd like to unwind it." But um, we've we've had this concept of backstop deals where some distributors are willing with the understanding this thing could end up becoming a streaming buy. They'll do a backstop type arrangement. And if, uh, if the producer decides to flip it to a big streamer, the distributor gets a, gets a nice check and doesn't take any distribution risk. Um, uh, and, and we've seen those as well. Um, but I think the, the, to Daisy's point, this all has to be discussed pretty much up front with the bank. There's no scenario where the bank is going to have money out um, on a loan without uh, assurance that um, there are contracts sufficient to pay uh, in some form or another the loan, whether they're minimum guarantees or other forms of commitments, or that they've taken gap risk, which David mentioned earlier, um, but, but I don't see a scenario where, you know, a bank would be exposed in, in the way you described where an Apple would pay, you know, or any streamer would pay significantly less than the budget and the bank is held kind of, uh, left holding the bag for the shortfall. And do it, are there, are there, um, in the agreement and let's say in the loan agreement with the producer are, are, th- is this addressed? Is 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 there is there anything that almost precludes the producer from going out and concluding a, a sale that would not meet the expectations of what the bank needs? So, in other words, if if you were if you were lending against five, let's say you five five pre sales were done on a project and film gets into can and a streamer comes along and says, I want to buy worldwide rights. You can, can they even have that conversation without talking to the bank? Right. So all that stuff could happen much later. Right. Right. And, and I mean, we have seen scenarios like that is certainly during 2020 there were some films that, that we saw where a number of pre-sales had been made. And then because of, because of the pandemic and because they were able to subsequently during 2020 make a sale to a streamer, the decision was made and it was in conjunction with, and then the bank was informed that they were going to undo all the pre-sales because a, a streamer sale was, was taking over all, all of those. So right. any, any change in the collateral that's been decided on up front when the loan is closed, you, you do talk to, to the bank about it. You, you have to per the loan agreement. Yeah, you, right. you would need the bank's consent. That's right. right. Yeah. And there's an agreement that is entered into also between the sales agent and the bank. It's called the sales agent interparty agreement. 
and and there are restrictions on types of things that the sales agent can do. For example, if they want to sell um, to a particular territory below the take, um, they would need bank consent oftentimes. Um, uh, so there are there are mitigants for a lender uh, in scenarios where you know um, things aren't going as planned and, and parties want to take a different course. Right. Well, and let, let's, uh, let's talk for a second about um, the, the, we'll talk about coverage, right? So, you know, if somebody comes to you with sales estimates and let's say you add up all the, con- all the key countries, right? And all of the um, asks for each country and all of the take numbers per country um, and you end up with, with some range and someone wants to borrow not only against the sales that have been concluded, but also wants a gap loan, as David mentioned, which is a loan against the unsold territories. Would you lend against all the unsold territories or and, and take all the unsold territories as collateral for that loan? Or would you lend against half of them or would you pick and choose? What's the, how, what's the, what's kind of the magic formula? Well, t- typically speaking, when we're presented with uh, the, the list of, of unsold territories, um, the, the amount that you're going to, you're going to lend against the, the takes, it, it, it's not going to be uh, the total amount. It's going to be some some portion, maybe half or or something like that, and it may not be all the territories that are listed there. It depends on the specific circumstance of the film and of the list of sales estimates and which sales have already been made. It's it's part of a larger picture right. that we need to assess on a picture by picture basis. This could be its own webinar, by the way, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. it's a complicated analysis. There are ratios of sold territories. To, I mean, there's there's a lot that goes into it. But I think, you know, uh, what you were describing, David, is, is a good good start. And actually, John, just to touch on another aspect of, of what you're asking here. So when you said, you know, and what will form the bank's collateral? So even territories that in our analysis and if we decide to lend a certain amount in gap, and that may be tied to in our analysis only a, a few territories, let's say, uh, any revenues that come in to this production from sales will go to the bank up, up to the point where the bank's loan is, is, is paid off. So even if we're not technically lending against any particular unsold territories, if they happen to make a sale in those territories during the term of the loan, those funds are supposed to go and must go to, to repay the loan. Just to sort of make that clear. Right. Yeah. The only, the only, um, so I think to David's point, the bank's collateral are all the territories typically on a, on a, single picture kind of financing of this type where you're lending against foreign pre-sales. We've seen certain rare circumstances where a particular territory might be carved out. The other big kind of potential carve out can be sometimes the domestic territory, uh, depending on the deal where a, a producer says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to borrow against the domestic deal, but I'm going to make one and, and, that's out of the collateral pool and, and, or the bank might have a second position lean in that territory because it's not lending against it. Um, but I think as a general rule, everything is the bank's collateral until it's repaid, even if they're not lending against that particular territory. Right. And, and so let's just in the managing expectations department, let's talk a little bit about, timing, right? How long is this loan outstanding? And I, I would suspect that, you know, the clock starts ticking when the money leaves the bank, right? And it's now being used for the production. And the clock stops ticking when the bank is paid back, right? And everything in between is the period during which the amount of principal that's left the bank is, is accruing interest, right? Which I'm sure is kind of pre-calculated by the bank, right? So you, you probably do the arithmetic 
before the money leaves the bank so that so that a producer is aware of what the net proceeds from that loan will be, right? So that they know how much cash will actually be made available to the to the borrower. And I, I, it's pretty safe to assume that, that you'll look at the total loan amount and from that you, you'd subtract the interest component, right? Which you've pre-calculated. You would subtract um, a loan fee, right? There has to be some kind of origination fee, I would suspect. And then the, 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 the bank's legal fees, right? So I don't think the bank ever absorbs their own legal fees, right? So that, that would be subtracted as well. And the amount of cash that's left over would go to the production. Do you, how do you determine what that date, that magic date is when you expect the loan to be prepaid? Or I shouldn't say prepaid, but just paid back. Well, I think that's going to determine on the production timeline. So when we're talking to a producer upfront, we need to see their production timetable and their production cash flow. Um, we will also work with the completion guarantor to determine if that production timetable is reasonable. And we will also include um, in that timetable any kind of uh, minimum number of days for events of force majeure. Just if something happens that delays production, right. and usually it's 60 days, right? So we would take the production timetable, um, we would include events of force majeure, and then we look at the delivery dates. So there's gonna be um, a date that's defined uh, where the producer needs to deliver the content to the sales agent or to the distributors. And once we have the delivery date defined, so that sets a range, maybe it's a year, 12 months, um, to include pre-production, principal photography, completion, post, et cetera, et cetera. So delivery happens 12 months after we start cash flowing the production. So then we look at the terms that the distributors need to pay. So sometimes it's in full at delivery, sometimes it's a portion at delivery and maybe 10% later when they do the dubs and you know, uh, various languages. So we will look at all of those elements to determine from start to finish the tenor of the loan and when we expect to be paid. And if there's a tax incentive that's part of our collateral, that's usually pushed out a little bit further. So maybe the, uh, the tenor of the loan might be ranging from 18 to 20 months. Right. So, but we do the work really looking at the production timetable. So I, I, I do want to take, there, there have been some interesting questions in the chat, which I, I want to get to. Um, but I, first I wanted to share with you that I think it was on Monday, um, I read that one of the larger streaming platforms picked up a, a feature film, but did not pick up worldwide rights in perpetuity. And it was, I thought, I thought that was really refreshing. I was glad to hear that. And because you know, I thought, well, geez, we all lend against MG. So it looks like we'll still have a job, <laughs> right? Because the, the streamer did not pick up worldwide rights and, and actually left several territories on the table, which was, which was, I thought that was a great sign. Um, somebody had asked a question about, you know, the extent to which the bank pays attention to or looks at or evaluates the creative elements of a project? Do you care who stars in it? Do you care who's directing it? Well, I can, I, I can answer kind of very high level. So generally, we're not um, taking a position or an opinion on specific individuals. What we would like to know, is this film commercial and marketable for the genre that it sits in and the sales agent that's selling it. So that's kind of high level that we typically don't take a position. I will say that, you know, we given, you know, events over the past, you know, several years where there are individuals that may face potential reputational risk. You know, we as bankers, we now get those questions from our credit committee. You know, what happens if you're relying on, let's just say a Tom Cruise, 
and something happens to Tom Cruise and he's not injured, right? Injury might be covered by the completion bond or uh, production insurance, but there's some reputational damage to, you know, very high profile uh, individual that's part and, you know, key to the production. You know, what is the likelihood of something like that happening? And, you know, what is the likelihood that distributors may want to back out of their agreement, even if the agreements are really locked up tight? You know, they might behave differently if something like that happens. So those are the considerations that unfortunately we, we kind of have to, you know, address um, and find ways to mitigate that. Um, so. That's, that's great. A great answer. Um, Tom, let me ask you, somebody asked a question. Um, what's the difference between a producer's rep and a sales agent? Uh, well, uh, the primary difference is producers reps typically are people you engage to help you with a domestic sale, meaning a U.S. based sale. Um, and I got to admit that, that that line has blurred quite a bit in recent years. Um, uh, and you've seen producers reps get involved in foreign deals or global deals with one with one buyer or streamer. Uh, but historically, producers reps were kind of who you went to to handle your domestic deal, whereas the sales agents were, you know, kind of carved out of the domestic piece and handled everything foreign. Right. And, and I, I, I seem to recall that in in a lot of the foreign sales estimates that I've seen, the the North American value is usually not on there. Right. It's usually not included. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of anybody's guess. Right. What um, what a domestic distributor is willing to pay for a project. Um, <clears throat> There, somebody asked an interesting question, David, I'll, I'll throw this out at you. Um, how tax incentives and tax incentive financing actually play, can play a part in bank financing. Sure. So in addition to lending against pre-sales, banks will lend against tax credits as another piece of collateral that'll form part of the, part of the overall financing. So, a uh, producer and a production company is going to be filming in a certain physical location, and they'll usually go to a place where there are tax credits offered. So, um, you know, certainly in the United States, I think most banks will lend against most of the tax credit programs. There are some foreign tax credit programs that are, are very familiar to the banks, like Canada, Australia. Uh, and the UK, and we also look at uh, other territories around the world as well. And we'll look at it uh, on a very high level, similarly to the distribution contract in the sense that we'll, be, we'll discount it. We'll apply what, what Daisy called the, the advance rate against that. So if there's a tax credit where the value of it is, is estimated to be a uh, million dollars, we're going to lend some some portion of that. It's typically it it, it depends on the on the territory. If it's somewhere like Canada, it, it might be that at some high advance rate like ninety percent, um, and then other territories uh, it, it, it may be lower. But that is another piece of collateral that that we do lend against. Right, and and can be consolidated right in one loan. You don't have to do two. If you're lending against. If you're doing a gap loan or you're doing uh, loans against pre-sales um, and a loan against tax credits, it, it can all be rolled into one loan, right? And, and, and it is. Right, right. Um, and that, and, those, and, those, and those, that piece of the financing obviously has kind of its own set of conditions, including oftentimes a, a plug for, for you guys, John, is bringing in an administrator, tax credit administrator to kind of help with the administration of the tax credit and sometimes even an opinion in advance of what the estimated tax credit would be that the bank will, will require. So. Thank yes, you, I, Thank I would you. like to, I would like to also point out um, that oftentimes is a critical feature because if somebody comes to me and says, I have a Hungarian tax credit, 
I will call you, John, and say, okay, John, I need you to look at this and you need to give me an opinion if the qualified expenses or what they're saying the qualified expenses are truly qualified expenses. It's a very detailed analysis that quite honestly, you know, I don't have the resource to do that. And that's why, you know, I need to call you. Thanks. Well, and I'll tell you, I use us too when I'm doing a loan against tax <laughs> credits. So, yeah. Um, so the last, last thing I want to ask, and I, I, you know, I don't want to throw any of the sales agents under the bus, but, you know, people always want to have, and again, this is in the managing expectations department. So, you know, somebody in the chat asked, what does this cost? You know, what does the sales agent cost? What are they, what do they charge for stuff like this? And, you know, I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen the gamut, right? I mean, I've seen people charge 10%, 15%. And in one case, a, a sales agent was getting a 25% fee. Sometimes they're capped, sometimes they're not. I mean, just for kind of budgeting purposes, what's kind of, what's a, what's a good range for, for, for producers to kind of have in the back of their head? When they're when they're talking to sales agents, the lowest possible commission. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I the, there are really three components to a sales agent's compensation. Right, there's the commission, um, and then there are two categories of of expenses. One are kind of uh, distribution mark, uh, you know, delivery type expenses, and they're those are typically fixed or capped. Uh, at some amount. And there are marketing fees, market expenses, where the sales agents incur expenses to visit the various film markets and, and festivals. And so those are, there's a charge that is part of the sales agent's compensation for those, that component of the services. And is usually allocated across various projects. We don't really know how they do it, but they do it uh, and they charge, you know, uh, a fee for that as well. Those are the three primary categories um, and they're all negotiable is, is all I can tell you. I mean, I, I negotiate the heck out of them when I'm on the producer side. And, and then of course there's this discussion of deferred or non-deferred as well. So. All right. Any, any last thoughts? All right. Well, look, I want to thank all three of you. Thank you so much for, for joining me today and sharing your wisdom and years of experience. And um, I will let Natalie take it over from here. All right. Thank you, John. And thank you, panelists. You did share a lot of great information today. And thank you to all of our um, audience members who submitted questions. We did get quite a few questions and we did our best to answer. But if we didn't get to your question, or if you think of anything beyond today's webinar, you can always head over to the productioncommunity.com. And we do have a forum there where you can keep the discussion going. And we will also post some Q&A from today's um, discussion so you can catch up with questions there. Um, but in addition to posting questions for experts, like our panelists. You can also connect with other professionals like yourself and our entire team of experts. And a few questions did come in about where to catch a recording of this. The Master Series recordings, um, today's recording and all of our Master Series library are available on ep.com slash Master Series. We have over 50 episodes available for viewing on demand at any time, including our film financing series that John is leading. We have COVID-19 analysis, incentives and financing instruction, legislation updates, and spotlights on regional jurisdictions. So we encourage you to head over and visit our library of webinars. And we also have the EP blog where experts like John put out regular content. If you're looking for guidance on production incentives or financing, we can help you out there. So please head over to the blog. And if you are looking for any additional resources about production incentives, our team of experts is here to help you to make sure that your production gets the best financing guidance in the industry. If you head over to our website, you can and check out the latest in incentives news. Use our production incentives map where you can click on regions around the world and see what incentives are available. We have a jurisdiction comparison tool and much, much more. So please head over and check that out. A special thank you to our fantastic panelists for joining us today and to you, our audience, for tuning in. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy and we look forward to seeing you at our next master series. Music